Yesterday marked the last day without pads of training camp. Today is a day off. Tomorrow is the first day in full pads. So it's easy for me to say to you that nothing that's occurred to this point matters, except, you know, there is some stuff. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into hockey and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. I spent yesterday in Latrobe checking out a pretty high octane set of seven shots down by the goal line. Some 11 on 11 looked like actual football, certainly got football sized reactions from the big crowd on hand. Big crowd. Chuck Knoll field bleachers were filled, but then off to the left and right and really circling the entire complex were fans filling the grass hillsides under trees on blankets and cheering, really cheering. Anytime, especially the offense, you know how that goes, made a big play. There was plenty of that. How much of it meant something? I don't know. But one thing that I liked that I heard from Mike Tomlin afterward was that this setup that they had yesterday in terms of their usage of players was aimed deliberately at getting certain guys more looks than they normally would. So TJ Watt gets the day off, Veterans Day off. Cam Hayward gets one. Patrick Peterson gets one. Isaac Salomalu was dressed, but he wasn't really utilized in as many snaps. And Tomlin said there were players in that category as well. Chuk Sikorafor, who's been around long enough to get himself a partial day off, he spent a lot of the day just on one knee watching. Who benefited from that? And that was Tomlin's term for this thing. Well, it was the guys you would expect. Other younger players that they wanted to see, to get their eyes on, to study the film afterward. And the one that Tomlin singled out by name was Broderick Jones. Jones was the first team left tackle through all of these sets of drills. While Dan Moore, and this is a process that began this summer, was moved over to right tackle, taking Chooks' spot, but also increasing his value through versatility by being able to work both tackle positions. But all eyes are always going to be on your first rounder, and I got to tell you, mine were for the better part of the day as well. What did I think? Well, the first thing I thought, at the risk of being repetitive here, was that this was not football in pads, so it's not to be taken too seriously. There's a different way that an offensive lineman can attack an edge rusher or a defensive lineman or whatever it is if they're in pads as opposed to just, you know, lining up with someone. And if you think about what Jones should be bringing to the table, it's his size and bulk and strength more than anything else. I mean, he's got athleticism to boot, too, but that's that's the when you look at him, he's just a giant human. And that is going to be a factor for him. What did I think of him otherwise? (laughs) Well, it, it didn't go all that well. He had a hard time reading whenever the defense would present something confusing to him. There was one particular sequence where he thought he should have lined up with the edge rusher. The edge rusher goes and drops back. Instead, and a corner comes in, blows right around him. Now, he correctly assessed that the corner was coming, but the corner goes around him. And not only does the corner beat him, but Jones reaches back and horse collars him. And I mean, flagrantly horse collars him. It would have been plain and simple a 15 yard penalty. And as Jones came off the field, there were a couple of his. Fellow offensive lineman offering some words of advice, Pat Meyer, the offensive line coach, came over and said something, and it was a learning experience. It might be a scheme, a a gadget that he hadn't seen in college where neither the offenses nor the defenses are even a fraction as sophisticated as they are in the NFL, or he also just might have been over eager or uh, 
never really even should have bothered with the corner because someone else would be there to pick up a corner blitz. And beyond that, he also had a challenging time with Nick Herbig. Now, when you're talking about training camp, there's always two sides to every story. If you're going to get excited about your offense scoring a touchdown, then be bummed out that your defense gave up a touchdown. And Herbig has been one of the more, I don't want to call him a surprise, I mean, legitimate draft pick seen as having a legitimate chance to be the number three edge rusher in this rotation, but he's been good. He's definitely made people notice, and he's been the one who's been lined up against the left tackle. And on this day, he was another of those beneficiaries because TJ was down. So what to take from all this? Is Broderick Jones going to be the starter against the 49ers? Are they going to just have Chooks on the right side and more on the left side the way they did last year? It's too soon to answer that. But what is telling is that they think enough of Jones where he is right now that they gave him this day to be the priority. Think about that. They moved not one player, but two players. From where they'd normally be, meaning more to the right side and chooks down to one knee to make sure that he could get himself a full day with the ones. And as Tomlin would further stress in that same session, the work that gets divided the rest of the way will be determined largely by how players like this perform when they're given these chances. And Jones did okay. He did okay. I'm not about to criticize him before they're even in pads. He did okay. My guess is that he's going to have to do a lot better than okay once the pads come on and once the preseason games begin in particular. When we come back, J1Q. Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George, LGKG, is a personal injury law firm in western Pennsylvania that represents people hurt in car accidents or who need help with workers' comp or medical malpractice. When the attorneys at LGKG make you a promise, they keep it. They've been keeping promises in our region for over 80 years. LGKG's been AV rated, the highest rating a law firm can receive, and They've been designated super lawyers. That's actually a thing for over 15 years. It's a rare combination. LGKG has offices in Cranberry, Newcastle, Beaver Falls, Butler, and Elwood City. Learn more about them by visiting lgkg.com or by calling 888-842-5454. LGKG. Today's J1Q comes from Coley, who says, DK, I do get the adding of Quan Alexander. Seems like an upgrade speed-wise, but how many inside linebackers can the Steelers really keep? If they need special teams coming from that spot, does that put Mark Robinson in jeopardy? Coley, uh, the, the best way for me to answer this, believe it or not, isn't to assess uh, Alexander, who I... I I said back in the summertime when he visited the South Side initially that that I, I like this player if he's healthy, but he's also been hurt three of the past four seasons. He's 28 years old, but he's coming with some mileage just based on the injury history. He is faster than either Cole Holcomb or Landon Roberts, so he'll be of more use to you when it comes to uh, coverage type duties. But he's just such an unknown when it comes to whether or not he's going to be available. When he didn't sign right after that visit over the summer, I was convinced, and I don't know how you couldn't be, that the Steelers found something in his physical or medicals that they didn't like. Something must have happened since then to change their minds because Alexander comes in and signs a contract and he's out there on the field Yesterday, didn't participate much, by the way. He was kind of staying off to the side, uh, just learning where the drills are and what he's supposed to do. I would imagine he's going to be a lot more involved, maybe intensely involved, when the pads come on tomorrow. But 
here's what you need to know. After the session was done and Tomlin was asked to address the state of inside linebacker, he said a lot of good things about Holcomb and Roberts, and he offered you know some optimism for what Alexander could bring to the mix. Never mentioned Robinson. And this is becoming a pattern. He's not the only one to not mention Robinson. My feel has been, and this goes back to minicamp, that someone within the Steelers, or maybe all of the someones within the Steelers, see a fatal flaw. Now, they have to see, just as we did late last season, that Robinson has uncommon closing ability and an uncommon physicality. But that's inside linebacker from seven, eight years ago, if not longer ago. And in 2023, you can't do it without covering. They've told Robinson that. They've spoken it publicly. This isn't some trade secret on South Water Street. They just feel that there's something that's missing there from his coverage. And if you'll recall, the Browns in that late season matchup at Akershire Stadium, they exploited him. They exploited him. They went right at him with the pass. They felt very good about doing that, and there was a reason for it. So does Robinson make the team? Does Robinson get cut? I'm not sure what your reference was to special teams because Robinson has participated on special teams. If anything, I would think that might give him a little bit of a an advantage in terms of staying on the roster if he can become an impact special teams guy. And his skill set would kind of make you think that's a possibility. But as far as inside linebacker goes, that name is just not coming out anybody's mouth. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. Again, the team is off today at St. Vincent College, back in action with a 1.55 p.m. practice. Tomorrow I'll be out there covering that one as well. If you are around and you see somebody walking around with a coffee and looking all haggard and whatever, just say hello. I'll be sure to wave back. 